Well, as we uh, break into this particular subject, I would like to uh, read a parallel passage in Luke's gospel where he essentially covers the same ground uh, that um, he covered in Matthew chapter 24, but it does give us a little bit more insight into what he is referring to by the abomination of desolation. Um, so let me go ahead and read this and I'll focus on a little bit more as we get into the, uh, the sermon. And don't expect me to untangle every issue this morning. Like I said, I don't have time to do that. I just want to look broadly at the fact that Jesus is the judge and he takes seriously uh, what it is that he says he will do. So let's begin in Luke chapter 21 in verse 5. And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he says, as for these things which you were looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another which will not be torn down. They questioned him, saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, see to it that you are not misled. For many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Then he continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes and in various places, plagues and famines. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute." But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land, and wrath to this people." And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There, uh, there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth dismay among the nations. In perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. Men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see it and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of all the earth. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. May the Lord bless His word to our hearing this morning. Now, as I've said, we've been focusing 
over the past several Lord's Days on the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so far we've seen that if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins, that he laid down his life for you, that he might pay for the crimes that would have condemned you, that would have destroyed you forever. And the Lord did that because he loves you. Sometimes we don't focus as much as we should, although, again, that's not the problem with the broad evangelical church today, but sometimes it's ours. We don't focus as much as we should on the love of Jesus Christ for us. That was a tremendous sacrifice that he made, a tremendous price the Father paid. Now, we saw also that the Father made sure that Jesus' death was, was public so that everyone might know that he can forgive sins, that he can forgive everyone who comes to him through Jesus Christ, and he can be righteous and just in doing so because a just payment has been made. He wanted to make sure that we saw that. We saw that Jesus rose again from the dead. Once Jesus paid for our sins, the sins that actually put him in the grave, the wages of sin is death, once he paid for those things, death could no longer hold him, and on the third day, he was raised again from the dead. The Father made sure that there were many people who saw him. Jesus appeared to the 11 disciples at different times, and he appeared to over 500 at one time, so that we would have the proof that everything Jesus said about himself was true, and that the Father really has accepted that payment. The fact that Jesus lives means that we are forgiven. Now, we also saw that because of what Jesus had done, because he had humbled himself and come into this world as a man to serve us, because he revealed the Father to us in the way that he lived, in the things that he taught, because he was willing to lay down his life for us to pay for our sins, because um, he set us free by crushing the head of the serpent on the cross, that Jesus was exalted. He was raised up to heaven. He was crowned king over all. We saw that from there he continues to minister to us. He continues to serve us. He teaches us through his word. He prays for us on the basis of the sacrifice which he has now made, the once for all sacrifice. And he continues as king to direct us through his word and the circumstances of our lives for our good as well as to fight against our enemies with the promise that one day they will all be defeated. Now, that's really what we want to follow up on today, on the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, focusing on this last point, that there is something that our Lord Jesus Christ continues to do to serve us as king and something he will yet do. And I should also mention something that isn't mentioned as nearly as much as it ought to be in the church today. You know, I was just saying a moment ago, perhaps we don't focus on the love of Jesus as much as we should. Well, that's obviously not a problem because that's all we hear in the broad evangelical church is that Jesus loves you, he has a wonderful plan for your life. And it's true if you're trusting him. But let's not forget that there is another part of the work of Jesus Christ that has to do with what he does to those who don't believe in him, who don't trust in his love, who don't receive his love. For them, there is judgment. And that's what we want to focus on today is the judgment of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he is subduing his enemies, that he is subduing our enemies, that they are being put under his feet. Now, we have in Scripture, of course, two premier examples of, of that actually taking place. The judgment that he brought upon the Jews in 70 AD and the judgment that he is going to bring upon the world at the very end when he comes at the second coming. This morning, we want to focus on his judgment upon Jerusalem in 70 AD because it is a grand illustration that proves that our Lord Jesus Christ takes his word seriously and that he is judging his enemies. Now, a great deal of what Jesus actually had to say about his coming uh, in judgment in Scripture really has to do with what he was about to bring upon Israel. And I believe, as I've already told you, that that is what he was talking about in the passages that we've read this morning in Matthew 24 and in Luke 21. 
I mean, listen to what he says in Luke 21, verses 5 through 7, which gives to us the context, what the questions were that were being asked, what it was that Jesus was actually explaining, to see that he was actually talking about that time frame. In Luke 21, verses 5 through 7, we read this. And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, as for these things which you were looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another which will not be torn down. They questioned him, saying, Teacher, when, will, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? Now again, notice they were talking to Jesus about the temple that existed in their day. Jesus, look at the temple. Look at the votive gifts. Jesus said, you see these things? This temple is going to be torn down. Well, then the disciples asked, when, Jesus, is that going to happen? And how can we know when it's about to take place? Well, Jesus told them that was what he was explaining. The same things that we saw in Matthew chapter 24. Now, as I have mentioned, Jesus does speak about the second coming before you reach the end of chapter 25, and that's likely because both of them are outstanding examples of the judgment of our Lord, and in many ways, AD 70 is a, a picture, just a shadowy picture, of what final judgment is actually going to be like when the Lord brings His judgment upon the wicked of all ages. There's no question, though, that he begins these sections by talking about his coming in judgment against the Jews in 70 A.D. And let me just again draw your attention to the fact that that is the very same thing that Gabriel was talking to Daniel about in Daniel 9, uh, verses 25 and 26. This is again what we read. Then after the 62 weeks... The Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Now, I want you to think crucifixion. Messiah, you know, there's a certain amount of time until Messiah comes. But then after the 62 weeks, which would be in the 70th week, Messiah is cut off. And as a matter of fact, he was cut off in the middle of the week. Three and a half years was the time frame of his ministry. And then notice what Gabriel says. And the people of the prince who is to come. And who is this prince who is coming? Well, if you look back at chapter 25, Messiah is the prince. He is the one being referred to in the context. The people of the prince who is to come, the prince being Messiah the prince, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, what city and what sanctuary is being referred to here? Jerusalem is the city and the sanctuary is the temple. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. What is Jesus talking about in Matthew 24, in Luke 21? What is Gabriel speaking of in Daniel chapter 9? He is talking about the judgment that is being brought upon Jerusalem and the temple that is yet future from their perspective but is past from our perspective. Now, the next question is, why was Jesus going to actually do this to the Jews? Well, the reason is because, as we've already seen, they are the ones who hated him. They are the ones who rejected him. They are the ones who handed him over to the Romans for crucifixion. Now, think about this for a minute. These things had to take place. They had to happen for our salvation. The Jews had to reject Jesus Christ. The Romans had to, be, had to crucify him so that we could be saved. But that doesn't excuse the Jews for what they did because what they did was commit the greatest crime in all of history. I mean, who is it that they actually crucified? Who is it that they killed? The Son of God. And so the Lord was judging them for this. Now listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46 in this parable of the vineyard. He says, listen to another parable. And by the way, he was speaking 
to the scribes and Pharisees, to the religious leaders of Israel. He says, there was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and it is marvelous in our eyes Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. When they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. Now, consider for a moment this particular parable. The owner of the vineyard certainly is God. The vineyard itself is Israel, the Lord's people. Actually, this is a quote from the Old Testament where the Lord says, he took, as it were, a vine from Egypt and he planted it in Israel and it was, it was growing. So the vineyard are God's redeemed people out of Egypt, his old covenant church. The vine growers that he rents the vineyard to are the spiritual leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. The slaves are his prophets, those that he sent to warn them when they were going the wrong direction to get them to go back into the right way, which, of course, the spiritual leaders abused. And the son is Jesus, the one that he sent to tell them the truth to fulfill the promise of redemption to them. But instead of listening to him and receiving him, they handed him over to the Romans to put him to death. Look, here is the heir. Let's kill him, and the kingdom will be ours. You know, the the scribes and the Pharisees knew who Jesus was. Remember, they, they saw him doing the works of the Messiah. Everything about him spoke that he was the fulfillment of all these promises. And that's why Jesus said to them when they accused him of casting out demons by the devil that they had committed the unpardonable sin because they knew Jesus was the Messiah and they knew he was doing this by the Spirit of God. They were actually blaspheming God's Spirit and they knew they were doing that. Look, here is the heir. Let's kill him and the vineyard will be ours. The reason why they handed Jesus over to the the Romans for execution was because they didn't want to hand over their authority and their power to somebody else. They wanted to keep it for themselves. Let's kill the heir and the kingdom will be ours. So what does the Lord say that he's going to do to them? Well, he's going to raise up his son, the stone which the builders rejected, to bring judgment upon them. He was going to fall on them and grind them to powder. Now, before the Lord actually did this, Jesus went on to say, actually, yeah, he does say it a little bit later than this parable in Matthew 23, verses 33 through 35, that he was going to send even more messengers to them before he would bring this about. And as a matter of fact, that's what Jesus did. Remember, he was crucified in 30 A.D., but 70 A.D. is when he brings his judgment. So there was 40 years where he sends his messengers out to preach the gospel to the Jew first and then to the Gentile when they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in Matthew 23, 33 through 35, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? 
Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Notice Jesus says, that he says, I'm going to send these to you. This was still future, and that's what he did during those 40 years in order to get them to turn away, but they were still going to kill them. They were still going to reject them, and because of that, Jesus was going to charge that generation with the blood of all the righteous that have ever been shed on earth. He was going to take the kingdom away from them and give it to another people essentially to believing Jews and Gentiles, to his redeemed, to those who would trust and receive the Messiah, those who would produce the fruit that he desired, which is the fruit of love and good works. So Jesus was talking about 70 AD, and he was saying the reason why he was going to bring that judgment is because of their treatment of all the righteous, their treatment of him, the treatment of those he was going to send to them, the treatment of his people. He was going to bring judgment on them. Now, thirdly, when was Jesus going to do this? Now, I've already told you it was going to be during their lifetime, and let me just point out a couple of things that show us that that is the case. Consider, first of all, Matthew 24, verses 4 through 6. Not only do we know from the opening sections in both Matthew 24 and Luke 21 that he was talking about the destruction of the temple, but notice who it is that Jesus is talking to and to whom these warnings are addressed. He's not talking about a future generation. He's talking about them. Look at verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place but that is not yet the end. And then we get to verses 15 through 19 of the same chapter. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Notice Jesus says to them, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of by Daniel, when you see it, then flee to the mountains, get out of Jerusalem. Now, the abomination of desolation is the same thing that Gabriel was speaking to Daniel about. That's what Jesus just said. But what was Gabriel talking to Jesus about, or to Daniel? He was talking about the destruction of the city and of the sanctuary, okay? The same thing Jesus is referring to. And that was by the Romans in 70 AD. Now again, listen to what Jesus says in a parallel passage in Luke's Gospel in chapter 21, verses 20 through 24. But when you see... Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. He's talking about the same thing. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that's what he's talking about here. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. And then notice Jesus gives them exactly the same instructions. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Those who are in the midst of the city must leave those who are in the country must not enter the city because these are days of vengeance so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. And again, the same warnings. Woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the, time, the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now again, this is exactly what happened 
in history. The armies of Rome came against Jerusalem in 70 AD. If you want to read a firsthand eyewitness account, again, look at Josephus' Wars of the Jews, the works of Josephus. He tells you everything that happened. They captured the city. It was besieged for something like 54 months. It was a long time. Or no, five, I'm sorry, it was about five months. And during that time, it was horrible within the city, but they eventually broke in. They dismantled the temple. Everything was destroyed exactly the way Jesus said. Now, Jesus used this foreign army to execute his judgment on the Jews for their crime of killing him, just as the Lord on other occasions has used other nations to bring judgment against his people. But I want you to notice, again, Jesus was addressing his disciples throughout this entire thing, and he says, you be ready. When you see this, you need to get out of the city. And then he says this in Matthew 24, verse 34. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, this generation does not mean this race of people, but it means these people who are living right now, this generation that is alive, they are not going to die until all these things take place. A little bit earlier, we read when Jesus was warning the scribes and the Pharisees that uh, I'm going to send you these wise men scribes and you're going to kill them and scourge them and crucify others and I'm going to charge all the righteous blood ever shed on you. He says in chapter 23, verse 36, the very same thing. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. I'm going to charge the righteous blood to you. It's going to come on this generation of people, those who are living now. Jesus was talking about what was going to happen to them. He wasn't talking about the future, our future. He was talking about their future, but it was the near future, okay, 70 A.D. Jesus even told the high priest that he would live to see these things when he was on trial before him in Matthew 26, 63 through 64, when the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, exactly how would the high priest see this? Well, I think when he says that he would see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, how did anybody know that Jesus was seated at the right hand of power? Well, they knew it from the day of Pentecost when Jesus sent the Spirit. That was the evidence that he had been glorified when he poured out his Holy Spirit. The high priest would see that. That was only a few days away from this event, really, not more than 50. But how would he see Jesus coming on the clouds? Well, I don't think he was necessarily going to see Jesus literally coming on the clouds because this riding on the clouds, as we noted last time, is really a symbol the Lord uses to describe his coming in judgment against a nation. We looked at this example in Isaiah 19, verse 1. The oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. The image of God riding in the clouds, coming in judgment, is not something that the Egyptians literally saw and not something that the high priests would literally see. It was an image of Jesus coming in judgment. You will see, in other words, my judgment against Jerusalem. You will live to see that. And you will know, Jesus was telling the high priest, you will know that I am the Messiah. Now, why was Jesus telling them all these things in advance? Well, for a couple of different reasons. We read in Amos 3, verse 7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. The Lord reveals what's going to take place to his prophets in order to prepare his people for what's coming and also to warn those who need to repent. Here, Jesus is warning his people of what was about to come because it was going to come within their lifetime. And again, historically, those believers who knew what Jesus said, 
when they saw the armies of Rome coming against Jerusalem, they said, it's happening just like Jesus said it was going to happen. I need to get out of here. And so those who were on the rooftop didn't go down into the house. They, they either must have gone up the roof some other way or they got down without gathering things. Those in the field didn't turn back to get anything, even in the field, because they only had a few moments to get away before the city was surrounded and everybody was trapped inside. But those who listened to Jesus were ready and they fled, just as Jesus told them they should flee. And they escaped. Many of them escaped, but there were some that didn't. And they had to suffer within the city because they were not listening to Jesus. Now, in closing, let me just simply ask this question. What does all this mean for us? I mean, what can we learn from this? Well, several things, I think. First of all, we need to understand the Father was serious when he said to Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies a footstool for your feet. You know that the Father has been subduing the enemies of Jesus Christ, not only from, you know, back then, but throughout history, and he continues to do so today. The Lord judges all who stand against him. And we're going to see that even more clearly tonight in the second coming and the final judgment. Everybody who resists Jesus, everybody who stands against Jesus, everybody who will not bow the knee to Jesus willingly is one day going to bow the knee before Jesus. Now, if you're trusting Jesus this morning, you, you understand that you have been delivered from judgment. You are safe. You're safe from the final judgment. Again, we might get caught up in judgment the Lord brings against this nation. I mean, we're all suffering because of what's going on in this nation right now. We, I think we all agree we'd like things to be a little bit different. It's going to affect us. The wickedness of the people around us is going to affect us. When God judges them, it's going to affect us because we live among them. But we have been delivered from that final judgment, as we're going to see this evening. We're safe in the Lord Jesus. By the way, that final judgment is going to be a lot worse than this one. But if you're not trusting Jesus this morning, you re have to realize you are not safe. You are in danger of his judgment. You need to turn away from the things that God tells you to turn away from, that are sinful, the things that he hates. And you need to turn to Jesus and trust in Jesus. If you do, you will be safe. Jesus tells you in advance what's going to happen so that you can get ready. That's gracious. That's mercy. And that's what he's extending to you. Now, secondly, we see that Jesus takes sin very seriously, especially when that sin is committed against greater privilege. I mean, think about uh, those upon whom this judgment fell. I mean, who are these people? These people are the Jews. And who was as privileged as the Jews? They were the ones that God had, had set apart in Abraham. He had given them his word. He made his covenant with them. He made many wonderful promises to them. He gave them his, his land. Uh, he blessed them as long as they were obeying him. He even promised them the Messiah. And he sent them the Messiah first. And what did they do with all these privileges that God gave to them? They took his son and they said, look, here's the heir. Let's kill him and the vineyard will belong to us. And then they, they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. That is why judgment on them was so severe. I mean, why have the Jews been going through the difficulties that they've been going through all these years? It's because when God sent his Messiah, his son to them, they took him and killed him. That, that is a crime that the Lord is still, of course, it seems like still punishing them for, but yet we know the Lord is also merciful and he is saving Jews today. Even as he's save, serving, uh, saving Gentiles, let's not forget, Gentiles are no wonder people. Uh, we were in darkness for all these years, committing all these acts of sin and wickedness against God uh, we don't deserve his mercy either, but God is being merciful to Jews and Gentiles. But I want you to see they had these great privileges. 
And so the Lord is bringing greater judgment on them. That is why it was so severe. Remember what Jesus said on one occasion? It's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for Capernaum. And why? Sodom and Gomorrah, I mean, bestiality, homosexuality, all this sexual sin, ungodliness. Capernaum, what were they doing? Well, they were rejecting Jesus as He preached in their streets, as He performed His miracles. They had greater light and greater privilege because Sodom and Gomorrah did this in the dark. Capernaum did this in the light. And so Jesus said it would be more severe for Capernaum than for these other wicked cities. The same thing with regard to the Jews. You had all these privileges. So what's the point? Well, the point is if you know what God says, you need to listen to it. God has given you privileges, privileges. You, you know things that some people are going to live and die and never hear. They're going to sin and die in the darkness. If you die in the light, things are going to be more severe for you than if you died in the darkness. If you know the truth, make sure you turn from your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus. You know who He is. You know what you're doing, the things you're doing that are wrong that you need to turn from. You need to respond to that. Now, if you've already done this, if you've already turned, make sure you continue to listen to the Lord because, again, as Christians, we have great privileges too. The Lord isn't going to judge us for our, when, we, when we don't do exactly what He tells us to do. He's not going to condemn us if we're in the Lord Jesus Christ, but He's still going to discipline us because He loves us. And he's going to hold us accountable for what we know. We need to do what we know. Are things going difficult for you in life? It might be. Because there's something you know you should be doing but you're not doing or something you shouldn't be doing that you're allowing yourself to do, perhaps the Lord is bringing it as a form of discipline. That's one reason. It's not the only reason. The Lord will bring things into our lives even when we're doing the best we can by His grace to continue to refine us and teach us and help us to grow. It's not always because of some particular thing we're doing or not doing. It's because the Lord wants us to grow. But the point is, if we know the truth, we need to live according to the truth. The Lord will hold us accountable for the truth. Thirdly, the Lord is warning. He's warning you in advance. If you haven't received Him, just as He was warning the Jews, He's given you some time to repent and to trust His Son. I mean, look at how long He, um, he, he gave them, quite a long time. Um, he, he's telling those of us who haven't trusted Him that we need to listen. He tells us in advance so that we will listen and we will respond. I mean, He doesn't just come down and bring judgment and then look back. See, I, I didn't tell you that was going to happen, but now that it's happened, I'm going to tell you why that's happened. The Lord is very gracious and He tells us before it happens so that we have time to deal with it and to respond. Now, we do need to bear in mind that God gives oftentimes a great deal of time, which means that He is very gracious. I want you to notice that when Jesus warned the Jews of what was going to take place, He didn't just warn them and then the next day bring judgment on them. He gave them 40 years, 40 years to listen, 40 years of sending His disciples out to preach and to teach Throughout the entire Roman Empire, when Jesus said that this gospel of the kingdom had to be preached in the whole world, I think he was meaning by that in the whole Roman Empire. And that's exactly what took place over the next 40 years. And that's why the disciples, when they went out to preach, they would preach first to the Jews because this was their Messiah, the promises were made to them. And then when they rejected it, they would turn to the Gentiles and preach it to them because God was giving them time. And once the gospel was preached throughout the entire Roman Empire, then the Lord brought judgment, but He took 40 years. God's mercy, God's grace. 40 years between really the time Jesus was crucified and the old covenant system was no longer valid, veil was torn, sacrifices no longer really had any meaning because Jesus had offered His once-for-all sacrifice. He let that temple stand for 40 years before He tore it down, before He brought judgment so that all the Jews could hear. God is gracious. He, he gives time. But let's not forget, 70 A.D. came. 
time eventually ran out for them. God doesn't wait forever. He is patient. He was patient during the days of Noah. He was patient then. He's patience toward us now. But time does run out, and once it's gone, it's gone forever. And for us, it is when we die. When we die, opportunity is gone. And if we, of course, harden our hearts against the Lord and we resist Him as He offers the gospel to us time and time again, there may come a time when He's going to give us up too. He may just hand us over and no longer offer the gospel to us, no longer work in our hearts in, in any gracious way. That can happen too. So there's opportunity now, but there isn't always opportunity. Opportunities run out. So turn to Him now. Trust in Him now because today is the day of salvation if you'll simply believe on the Lord. And then finally, again, we need to realize that that time can come when we're not expecting it. Remember how Jesus said on numerous occasions as He's warning them about this coming judgment on 70 A.D., you need to be awake. You need to be on the alert because I'm coming like a thief. You don't know the day or the hour of my coming, so be ready at all times. We also do not know when our time is up. We don't know when the end comes, okay? Now, just recently, I heard about three young college students that died during spring break. They were just going to do something, nothing necessarily, you know, that was, that was inappropriate that I'm aware of, I think. The three that I'm aware of were, were Christians, I think. But they just happened to be going down the road, and one of them got rear-ended and, and uh, ended up causing brain trauma that, that destroyed the brain of this one young man, and, and he, he died. And then two young ladies that were, I believe, were sisters who ran into a student from the very same college they were going to head on, and, and they, they died. Now, I would imagine that you know, none of those three were actually expecting that to happen. They thought they probably had their whole lives ahead of them, you know, that they lived to be maybe 80 or so years old, and they were only in their 20s, and yet they died on that day unexpectedly. You see, we don't know when the day of our death is. We, we could be dead before today is over. We don't know that we have any more time. Our life is just like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. That's why we need to be ready. Jesus kept warning His disciples they needed to be ready because they did not know when it was coming. So you and I don't know when the Lord is coming for us. You know, we're not talking about the second coming. We could die at any time. That would be the second coming for us, right? Because Jesus will come and He will deal with us at that particular point, so we need to be ready. We are here right now. We're having the gospel offered to us. If you haven't received Jesus, receive Him, trust in Him. And if you have received Him, then make sure you are ready at all times to meet Him. If you're trusting in Jesus and you're walking with Him, you will be ready to meet Him when He comes. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us apply what we've heard.